Welcome to the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series, State of the Energy Industry in Europe. Dr. Adriana Ramirez, Chair of the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee, and myself, Lori Weitzel, will serve as your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation followed by a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you'd like to ask questions, please raise your hand in the webinar interface and I will adjust your settings to allow you to ask your questions directly to the presenter. Here's a bit about our presenter. Rune Peterson joined PGS in October 2010 and became president and CEO in 2017. His previous responsibilities at PGS combined the role of general counsel and head of the legal team leading the communication, strategic customer relations, meeting, marketing, and corporate development functions. Prior to joining PGS, Rune served for four years as a partner in a law firm of Ernst de Besch, specializing in oil and gas. Before that, he worked as an attorney and associate in the same firm. He started his career as a junior research fellow at the University of Oslo and has served as a deputy judge in District Court of Norway. Rooney has a law degree from University of Oslo, a postgraduate diploma in European competition law from King's College in London, and an MBA from the London Business School. Let us please welcome Rooney Peterson, and we hope you find his presentation interesting and informative. Welcome. Thank you very much. As uh, you will see from the slide in front of you, I will uh, be speaking uh, to a topic which is the changing landscape of the marine geophysical industry from 2013 to 2018. And uh, towards the end of the presentation, I will ask the question of whether we are ready for an upturn in activity. We have been through a significant downturn uh, and that downturn has changed the industry. Uh, so I will go through a little bit of the causes of the downturn, how it has changed our industry and what we look at today and use some of those uh, key learnings from the downturn uh, to uh, give some predictions of where we are going and ask some questions of whether we are ready uh, for a different market going forward. So that is in a way what you can expect from, uh, from this presentation. Okay, here we are. Um, all right, we, um, uh, this is a slide from uh, the PGS, uh, probably uh, first quarter, second quarter uh, results or a presentation we held in June of 2013. Uh, as you will remember at that time, the oil price was still very high uh, and, uh, and activity was reasonably okay. But we were starting to feel the initial um, initial results of what we will you know later experience to be the longest downturn of our history as you can see from the two um, points that are identified here in red we already at that stage you know, identified that our clients free cash flow were under pressure and I'll get back to you and explain how that could be the case when they had a hundred million or a hundred dollar barrels per dollars per barrel and would that uh, cash flow under pressure impact seismic spend in the years to come? And you can see from uh, the, the graph here, which shows the blue line here shows the bids and the value of the bids we had in-house in PGS at the time. And the gray line shows the bids plus the leads we had in the marine contract market at the time. Uh, it is at okay levels you can see the drop here in the uh, in the financial crisis and then it started to pick up again but the bidding activity was already then starting to lag a little bit so we started to see the first indications of what would later come although we of course did not understand the gravity of it at this stage this was uh, from the december of 2013 where we had Rista energy uh, prepare a report for us uh, on the future of uh, seismic. And as you can see, uh, first of all, it looks very optimistic. It will grow uh, as predictions do, straight, basically, either flat or up. Uh, but even in this, 
uh, in our capital markets day in December, where we look at this uh, top point here is oil companies focus on cash preservation, reduces short term seismic growth. That is important to know. Once again, we focus on the, uh, our clients' cash generation and uh, that we are starting to feel that uh, impacting the seismic uh, short term. And we started to think at this stage and we started to introduce a, uh, the first elements of a uh, cost reduction program already at this stage. But we believe that uh, longer term, the structural growth for the marine seismic is intact, which is also uh, important to remember. So what happened uh, in, uh, in these years? Here, what you can see here is from 2004 and all the way to 2016, the bottom line is uh, a set of oil companies given on, uh, on the bottom here, quite a few of the larger oil companies in the world. And you take their cost and their investments and you uh, turn it into a barrel per oil. So the barrel per oil price is here and then you take all their cost and in, uh, investments and you turn them into the same and then you see that they started out in 2004 with a uh, cost and investment around equaling around $20 per oil and ended up uh, up here at 109 I believe uh, $109. So we have more than a five times increase in cost and investments in a period less than 10 years. This blue line, uh, which I'm now indicating, is the same line as this, but we have just added dividend. And dividend to our clients are almost like a cost. They will not cut dividend, they will surely cut they will surely cut seismic spending long before they cut dividend, which is what we have seen in this downturn. So what you see is all the way up to the financial crisis, the oil price, which is this dotted line, were above both of these, which basically means that while they were paying dividend and uh, investing uh, along here, they were cash flow positive and therefore reducing that and making money, obviously. In the second period from the uh, financial crisis up to 2013, what we see here is uh, that the cost uh, in itself is uh, below the, the um, oil price line most of the time. So that means they are in a way making money, but uh, that is not the case when you add the dividend. So in this period here, they are basically break even. They're not taking, uh, they're not increasing their uh, debt and they're not repaying the debt after paying dividends. Now that changes up here. As you see, as you see the oil price uh, fall below the blue line, that means that these companies in this period, all the way from there to here to 2016, were incurring more debt to pay dividend. When this happened, Already here, we felt it, as I showed you on the previous uh, on the previous um, pages that we felt it in the seismic industry. And then, obviously, when the oil price drops and you have uh, this development at the same time, uh, you see here that their cost and capex continue to drop dramatically. And why is that? That's because they stop spending, stop spending on seismic, stop spending on drilling, and also uh, started to save cost internally. So that is what happened in this third phase and which led to uh, this. Uh, on the left side here, uh, you can see Pareto's estimation of uh, the drop in uh, EMP spending in total, which is approximately 50% from uh, 2013 until 2017. And the drop in seismic spending in the same period is some 70%. Or 67, I think the, the number is in, uh, in this uh, graph. But obviously, when a market like ours is hit with uh, a 67% drop in activity in, uh, in four years, we will experience a significant crisis, which we did. Now, if we look ahead and turn the picture a little bit, we, we know what has happened. We know a little bit of why that happened. And that is because our clients stopped making money. Uh, and when the oil price on top of that, and, and after that dropped significantly, then, uh, uh, then obviously they stopped, they started uh, saving money wherever they could, including on expiration. 
However, if you look at the demand picture for uh, oil and gas, which is the underlying driver, obviously, for us and others, you will see that it is an increasing trend. And it has been an increasing trend through this whole uh, downturn. The demand has kept on growing. And the estimation, this is uh, BP's World Energy Outlook of 2017, the estimation is that it will continue to grow. And uh, you have seen the oil price starting to pick up, and the reason for that is uh, that demand has caught up with production. And what you all, all when, when you see this demand picture, what you also will understand is that this crisis was not cre uh, created by a shock to the demand side. It was created by overproduction and more uh, more oil into the market, while uh, while demand kept on growing. However, now that we are more in a balanced oil and gas market, uh, we uh, we will start have to start seeing an increase in production to keep up with this demand picture, as you now see. And the increase, of, of course, is much larger uh, than this when you take into account the decline rates for exist from existing fields. So we need to find new oil and gas uh, into the future to meet this demand picture. And have we done so? Well, no. Uh, and it's not surprising that over the last years where the oil co companies have cut their exploration spend and all other costs dramatically, that we have found less oil and gas than ever before. And in 2017, uh, the discoveries of just 7.8 billion uh, barrels of oil equivalent, and which was 30 billion in 2012. And this is the lowest level since 1947. And, uh, and the exploration spending and drilling have uh, been significantly reduced. And then we get down to unsustainable uh, levels of new oil and gas. So what we have done is that in response to an oversupply crisis, we have dramatically cut exploration. That does, obviously doesn't have any impact on the supply side in the short term, but it does in the long term. Underscoring this is that uh, the size of the oil discoveries we have made have steadily diminished over several years. This is from the HSBC peak oil report of 2016, so uh, not updated, but I couldn't find an updated picture, and I think the, the picture has continued this way, is that we find less and less. And we have uh, a number of exploration wells we drill are fewer and fewer. And the success rate of those rates are lower and lower. So all in all is that we are seeing uh, over time a continued increase for oil and gas. We have, uh, we have caught up with supplies, so supply and demand is you know, reasonably in uh, um, meeting each other currently. And we have for several years cut down on exploration. So we have explored less, fewer wells. And the exploration we have done is less effective. This will impact supply in a few years. So what is the uh, what is the answer to this? Is obviously more exploration. And uh, but however, we will not see more exploration unless our clients can afford it. And this is, as you will recognize, the same picture I showed you earlier. Except now uh, we have included some more years after 2016, or you could call it the fourth uh, phase. What you now see is that the oil price. Uh, which is an, um, it's a forward estimation of the oil price, um, uh, the dotted gray line here, is now above both uh, cost of capital, including dividend uh, and capex, and, and cost, uh, not cost of capital, cost and capex, which you have here, and cost and capex and dividend, which you have here, and the oil price is above that. And in fact, the oil price is sitting up here somewhere. Uh, now, so uh, our clients are making massive cash flows currently. So yes, our clients can also afford to uh, to look for more oil because they are obviously also seeing what I just explained to you that we have an increasing demand and we have uh, not looked for oil for several years, which will impact supply. 
Uh, and then we will either need to look for a lot of oil and bring it online rather quickly, or we will have a very high oil price going forward. So, no wonder, and this is uh, from PDS again, and this is the same picture I started to show you with the, the bids, marine contract bids in-house, and the bids and leads in-house in PDS today. And now you see what has happened is that uh, this is trending upwards, both of it. The volume of acquired marine 3D seismic we believe will be higher in 18 than 17. Uh, and these are leading indicators of an uh, improving market. Therefore, this is why we say to the market today that higher oil price improved cash flow among oil companies, which I have explained to you, and an exceptionally low oil and gas discovery rate are expected to benefit the marine 3D seismic market fundamentals. And we have seen it in the multi-client space already, and we are starting to see it in the marine contract market. So, the question is, are we ready? to meet this increase in demand, which may come and I, which I believe will come. And even more importantly, are we as an industry ready to contribute to an increase in the oil and gas discovery level through new technology and better seismic? And this is, and still remains and will remain and has remained, it's just been masked by the, very, uh, the crisis we have had, the key question, can we get the exploration success rate up to improve it. And I believe that new technology and better seismic, both better seismic and how we use it, is the key to these things. So are we ready for that as an industry? Because obviously our industry and the players within it has been formed not by this challenge, but by the crisis we've been through. Have look, let's have a look at that. In 2013, uh, the uh, competitive landscape looked something like this, which you now see. Western GECO, CGG, PGS, and I will include FUGRO in there as well, were larger integrated uh, seismic players, which all had, uh, uh, they had vessels, they had a, an imaging uh, business, and they were playing both in multi-client and they were playing in contracts. So they had an integrated uh, full offering. Uh, several of these companies were spending quite a bit of money on our, our on R and D and developing uh, developing new solutions, which obviously challenged each other uh, to improve. So there was a competitive landscape also on new solutions. We had Polarcus and we had Dolphin, which were smaller, but they were both playing in uh, the marine contract market and in the multi client market, and they also uh, claimed to have differentiating technologies at the time. And then we had TGS and Spectrum, which was focused multi client companies. So, uh, quite a few companies uh, six companies, and four of them quite fully integrated at that stage. Now, we have, of course, met this crisis by reducing supply has been absolutely uh, necessary and the only thing we could do to survive in this market. So therefore, we have taken down the average stream of capacity by close to 50% from 2013, and we've reduced the number of active 3D vessels in the market from some 59 to approximately 25. The reason I say approximate here is, uh, you know, should you count the Western GQ vessels currently? What about some of the uh, Chinese vessels only operating in China and things like that? So you will see numbers from 22 to 29 of what is operating today. But the point is a substantial decrease. And we have saved money on CapEx. Therefore, the stream or pool of this industry are older and aging than it used to be in 2013. Important to remember. Offsetting this a little bit, I would just like to highlight uh, that uh, all of us have improved um, improved the um, productivity of our vessels. This is an example from uh, from PGS, where you can see that uh, the number of 16 streamer operations, 14 streamer, 15 streamer operations uh, have increased quite a bit, uh, and the number of Eight, six are gone, eight is almost gone, 10 is almost gone. Uh, so obviously we do, we are more productive today. And this is the same with uh, other players, uh, probably not as dominant as you can see here, but still same trend. 
Another thing that has happened through this downturn is that multi-client has become the preferred business model. Here you can see uh, uh, how contract and uh, multi-client has developed in terms of share of market. So the, uh, the sum of these of the dots, the dots in a year will always be 100. What you see is that in 17 for the first time, and we believe in 18 even more so, multi-client will be the dominant business model shooting sides. Back. This is a result of um, more uh, acreage being available, uh, several countries making their, their countries more adaptable to the multi-client uh, business model, but it's clearly also a result of the downtrend uh, in the market where uh, reduced budgets within our clients have led to how can I get seismic uh, cheapest. And multi-client is uh, per square cheaper than contract. Uh, I think this uh, is a reason to believe that this will swing back a little bit, uh, although not back to what we saw in uh, 2006. I, uh, this will reverse a little bit as budgets uh, come up again and, and oil companies uh, will probably prefer to have some of their uh, more some more of their size make um, uh, for themselves and not shown to other clients. There is also greater overlap today between the multi-client and contract and, and projects tend to uh, switch between the two. Uh, while in 2006, there was a much more distinct, if it was a multi-client, it was a multi-client and it would never go anywhere else. Uh, and the uh, same with the contract. Now there is much more overlap. Uh, further, there has been no return on uh, technology investments over the last three to four years, or at least very limited. So obviously it has been better for a company not to do R&D than to do R&D, uh, as oil companies have clearly focused on cheaper seismic rather than uh, quality and, and, and looking for new, uh, new stuff where they, uh, where they would support a more expensive but um, higher grade of seismic. This, I think, will change uh, as oil companies turn to their the unavoidable question of how can we improve the exploration success rate. So, some uh, numbers for you just to give you an overlap of what we have done uh, in this industry from 2013 to 2017. Uh, we are now today, seven, or end of 17, we're probably fewer today. End of 17, we were 7,476 employees in PGS, CGG, TGS, and Plarkus, which is a reduction of 45%, uh, 45 from 2013. We spent 243 million on CapEx in PGS, CGG, and Plarkus, a reduction of 70% uh, versus 2013. We spent 700 and, uh, 74 million on multi-client investments between the uh, PGS, TGG, TGS, and Polarcus, and it's a reduction of 45% today. Some of that is more effective operation and obviously lower price, uh, which is basically the contract market where TGS buy cheaper vessels today than what they did in, uh, in 2013. So it may not be a reflection of, of investments in square kilometers just on this point. R&D. Uh, is now 114 million gross for CGG and PGS, basically the two companies doing R&D. And only for those two companies, a reduction of more than 50% uh, versus 2013. The reason I haven't include, included Western GECO, which obviously would have been relevant for these numbers, is for obvious reason, and the fact that it's uh, uh, not disclosed to this level by Schlumberger uh, in, their, in their disclosures. So therefore, it's been difficult for me to include the numbers there, uh, although that would have been relevant. I think the point is, we are, have reduced manpower, R&D spending, CapEx, dramatically in this period. And the competitive landscape looks something like this. We have TGS, sorry, CGG and PGS, uh, which remains uh, larger integrated uh, seismic players operating both in multi-client and in contract with an R&D um, facility and with good imaging houses. And then I put Western GECO uh, not as sharp as the others, as, uh, as it's unclear what is going on there. 
Uh, what we hear uh, publicly from them is that they will continue as a um, multi-client market with uh, multi-client and imaging, and therefore place themselves as a focused multi-client company together with TGS and Spectrum. And as you know, they're trying to get rid of everything else uh, currently, but that uh, situation is unresolved. And then you have Polarcus and Sharewater, which are uh, focused uh, vessel, small vessel owners, basically almost exclusively operating in the marine contract market, and obviously as chartered vessels for TGS uh, in the multi-client market, and with no technology and, and, uh, and uh, running a uh, cheaper uh, cost operation uh, is there. there. Seems to be their um, comparative, uh, their advantage in the market, what they're focusing on. So compared to the, you know, uh, six vessels plus TGS and Spectrum, we now have uh, five, but in fact, we only have two big integrated uh, players and everyone has specialized much more than what they used to do in 2013. So, how is this uh, industry, which I've just described, ready for an uptick in activity? And obviously, the reason I ask this is that is the competitive landscape I have just been through has not been formed by uh, how do we view the challenge of the future. It is generally been formed by necessity through the worst downturn we've ever been through. So we have currently companies with weak balance sheets. We have most of the players I just went through have no differentiating offering at all and nothing on, uh, on the step because there has been very limited uh, investments in R&D. And we have a significant streamer capex needs in the short term. So it's, it's a reason to believe that before R&D uh, spend goes up, uh, people will have to spend on capex just to keep their operations running with new streamers. Recent demand for cheap seismic may uh, uh, has not given no return on technology investments, uh, uh, as I've uh, stated. While what we're hearing now from oil companies and what I believe will be the trend when uh, people start making money again is that the oil companies will once again want to address the declining exploration success rate. They will start focusing on marine, uh, marine contract business model, bespoke imaging to their needs, and therefore, and you know, more high quality uh, seismic. And we have not invested in that for many years, most of us in this industry. Uh, CDG, PGS have still kept on their uh, investments. I know also that Western Geco has done so, but with a very unclear situation of what is now going on, obviously. Uh, and I've, as I've shown to you, uh, R&D investments, even in PGS, has gone down quite a bit. We may see a return of the contract business model, as I have explained. There are a few players. Uh, not a big issue, I think, because uh, CG, PGS, uh, Polarcus, and Sharewater can all deliver marine contract services, so that in itself is not a, um, is not a uh, big problem. But, there, uh, but the fact that there is uh, less distinction between multi-client um, uh, and uh, the marine contract model, and uh, we see more and more of the clients you know, coming to say, should we do it as a multi-client, should we do it as contract, and then we have a, uh, have a discussion about it. If there is no late sales potential as well, then there is, this, is a contract, uh, this is a contract. We may still do permitting, which we do on uh, multi-client, or if they are not, uh, too eager uh, on keeping everything by themselves and we see a, an exploration potential and late sale potential outside of what they want to shoot. We may combine it and then make it into a multi-client. Things like that happens all the time. There are basically only two players who can play that model fully and that's CDG and, uh, and PGS now, uh, which is not a lot of competition in that area. We also believe that oil companies is likely to demand more 4D and 4D uh, lends itself to integrated acquisition and imaging solutions. And, uh, and I believe also that over time, uh, if you do one 4D, you should do the next. So you, it lends itself to long-term contracts, uh, but then you need obviously a financially strong player, which you know will have both a contract or acquisition capabilities and imaging capabilities in the long term to be able to take that out. 
and only very few players in this market have that as everyone is specializing on on imaging on multi client on contract um, and common for all of us we uh, there has been significant staff reduction across the industry uh, which may cause a challenge uh, if this market recovers quickly. Many people, many young people have left this industry and we have forced them to leave uh, and they will not return. Many of them will not return. There are very few people starting, at least in Western uh, universities in Europe in particular, a little bit the uh, same in the US, starting on uh, petroleum related um, subjects geophysics geology etc uh, which then gives uh, a limited uh, an amount of people coming into our industry and obviously we will need more people if this market starts to grow which is a huge challenge uh, going forward there is some uh, uh, some light in the tunnel as this is still quite popular i believe in uh, both in asia and we begin at yeah, africa up and running that can alleviate this problem a little bit, but uh, but the problem is still there, clearly. And not related to what is going on, but I still would like to mention it. The environmental requirements and the environmental push we are meeting uh, today, both on um, uh, recruitment, you know, what is the image of our industry, on permits, uh, where can we shoot seismic, and access to areas where people uh, or some countries are closing down for the further oil and gas uh, activity is also a challenge we need to meet in the future. And, and uh, the downturn we've been through with a scale off of people and competence have at least not helped us address this challenge. So all in all, uh, what you see, and I've tried to pull up, is uh, a picture of an industry which has been driven into one uh, shape or form by a substantial downturn. Uh, and this is not a criticism because we have had no choice. Most of these companies have either gone bankrupt or gone close to bankrupt or had to get significant funds from, uh, from shareholders. So this is, uh, we have been forced into this. But the shape we are currently in, in my opinion, uh, is reasonable to question whether that shape is the best shape to address the challenges that lies ahead. And just on the last of a little bit of why we in PGS have uh, picked a strategy we have picked, continued to be an integrated player, continued to invest in R&D. It's not believe, because we believe the market will continue as is, then we would have had to chase, uh, choose a different strategy. It's because we believe that uh, what I've just been through will take place and that at least we are slightly better positioned than we otherwise would have been. Uh, by this, uh, by this strategy uh, of retaining R&D, retaining an integrated offering, retaining vessels, and continue to try to improve the image and the quality of what we are doing. So with that, I think I will uh, uh, leave it for uh, questions. All right, thank you very much. It was, uh, I really enjoyed the presentation. So now we will open up uh, our question and answer session. Uh, those of you in attendance, if you have a question that you would like to ask uh, directly, please raise your hand and I will put you in a position where you can ask your question. All right, uh, I guess I will start with one. We always need a little bit of an icebreaker. <laughs> um, so, you you indicate you know all the different areas that uh, all all the players in this area have uh, reduced their ex expenditures on, um, and uh, you indicate that uh, due to the reduction and um, lack of development of new uh, streamers streamer technology, that there will be uh, have to be a capital investment uh, as the industry moves forward. So, is there a particular? Uh, uh, technology that might be out there that uh, the players were aware of that they haven't been able to um, put into service that is might be something easy and quick to get on the market and maybe set the uh, technology standard as we move forward? Um, 
I don't see that, uh, to be quite honest. Um, it's um, To that question, obviously, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to the isometrics uh, streaming technology of Western GCO as uh, uh, in the current transaction. I have no insight into what they are thinking there, but, uh, but um, it will be interesting to see whether uh, that technology survives uh, the current M&A uh, they are undertaking. I think the issue is more uh, that um, no one has really put a lot of effort in uh, in uh, R&D, let's say more long term. Everyone has, everyone has uh, or the people that are doing R&D, R &D, uh, for example, uh, CGG and PGS has spent most of that on uh, more short term, I believe, than a long term investment in, uh, in R&D. And that obviously uh, will hit us uh, as we move forward. As uh, in the old days, we used to have a pipeline of more exploratory and, uh, and uh, long-term focused R&D, which we have been forced to uh, forced to reduce our efforts in, uh, and therefore we have been set back, in my opinion. But it's, it's difficult to point to a particular technology which has suffered, or a particular technology sitting there which we can bring online now that we have no more money. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, Timothy, please uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hmm. Hello, uh, Tim? You should be able to ask your question directly. Hmm. All right. Oh. Okay, I can ask a question in the meantime. This is Adriana, Adriana Ramirez. Uh, Runa, thank you for your, your talk. Uh, I have one question. In recent years, we have seen a trend uh, to go for towards more nodes for exploration, even for multi-client nowadays. Uh, what is PGF's view on this? How will the introduction yes, that is, um, of nodes affect uh, the following year? Um, no, that is I, I, that is um, one of the very interesting uh, developments that is in fact happening, uh, and uh, and I didn't include it in the in the um, in the presentation just to kind of keep it on the main market to put it that way. As node is currently still a bit of a niche. But it is a very interesting niche and, and one where you actually have had some uh, technology development over over the last uh, uh, last uh, years. I exactly. believe, yeah, I believe that uh, nodes will be uh, here also going forward. I mean, in the past we have seen uh, sea bottom size make come and go uh, at least uh, a few times, uh, but I, at this time I think. They kind of cracked the nut and are here to stay. So I do believe this is an interesting addition to uh, to uh, uh, the streamer seismic market. I also believe that it currently is more uh, a market for 4D uh, in in particular areas and also for uh, areas where the geology is very complex, uh, so that. Um, oil companies have a very high willingness to pay. Because even if uh, uh, costs have come down and, uh, and according to the node players, they should be able to drive the cost further down, uh, it is still quite a bit more expensive than, uh, than streamers seismic. But all in all, I think it's an interesting development. Uh, I think nodes are here to stay. And, uh, and uh, we, as I've said many times, watch this market quite carefully. Thank you. Great. Um, that was actually one of the questions from uh, that came in uh, via the chat. So I, I think uh, you answered that pretty well. Um, Joseph, uh, you should be able to ask your questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Joseph Parsonov, Fairfield uh, Geo, and also Hi. chairman of the team. Um, given the fact that hydrocarbons are in the foreseeable future the energy source of the world, and, uh, but we also have the fact uh, of climate change. 
And it seems to me the geophysical industry is uh, really the only practical uh, solution right now. And I'm talking about carbon sequestration. So uh, that would add uh, business to the industry and also would uh, help solving a, a huge problem we have right now. And also would uh, incidentally help uh, solve the problem with younger people in the industry because younger people do not want to join the industry because it is perceived as uh, uh, too, too dangerous and too environmentally unf unfriendly. So what do you think what the industry should and could do to, um, on a technical side uh, and on a, on a political side, just in, in promoting, uh, uh, talking to the politicians to promote that funds be made available to, to get started on this seriously? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I like that question. Uh, first of all, it addresses a real issue, as you say, the, uh, the climate change issue and, and also, uh, also a potential solution where uh, you can address both climate change and, uh, and uh, uh, have a viable future long term for our industry. Um, so, um, uh, I believe, uh, as you say, if, you, if, you're gonna, uh, if you're going to segregate carbon from uh, production and uh, where we come in, store it back into the subsurface in uh, uh, either as uh, as you produce or in uh, in already produced um, in already produced reservoirs uh, both you know are possible and you need seismic for both uh, we we are here uh, as an industry dependent on uh, on um, uh, them uh, success in actually segregating this large scale uh, and we have for several years you know you have basically you have the technology of segregating carbon um, from gas on a small scale. We have several technologies and they're all uh, proven to work, but what we have yet to accomplish, uh, and I'm not talking about the geophysical industry, more like mankind or whatever, is to do this massively on a big scale, uh, cheaply enough. Um, I think, we, and it has, it had much more, and I say it had a much more traction, at least public traction, uh, some, Three, four, or five years ago than it has today. Uh, in the in the public domain, it kind of now seems to be lost a little bit. But I do believe there are still uh, development uh, going on into this area. Uh, and uh, politically, we should keep on encouraging that. I know Equinor has a problem. Uh, sorry, a project of uh, of trying to take out carbon on uh, on uh, on the platform and re-injecting it in so that the gas they send is completely clean. Um, and uh, and there are other similar projects. I would of course welcome that. And uh, and as PGS, we would be willing to put R and D money into that if it became a a, a viable business for us. Currently, we are uh, we are not um, or we are not at a size where we can solve this alone. It needs to be you know the primary issue needs to be solved by others, and then we need to chip in with what we can do. But uh, but this is one of the <laughs> uh, uh, glimmer of hope uh, in uh, in the whole oil and gas climate change uh, area uh, carbon uh, carbon separation. But it's difficult for us to solve it as an industry. We are a small industry, uh, but we should clearly um, encourage others to keep on doing what they're doing and help where we can. Thank you. Yeah, it seems to me that, that that's the next step really would be uh, for the industry as a whole and, and mostly the big oil companies uh, to push uh, the politics to, 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 to make laws, put laws into place, to, to put the financing into place. And then the technical solution uh, will, will be found. I mean, we know we can do it, uh, it, it just, but it, it will take money. Um, mm. And then, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll see if we can unmute Tim. Maybe he wants to uh, send his question in via chat. Okay. Uh, okay anybody, let's try again. Any, anybody else have a, a question? All right. I'll ask a, another question. Um, in your presentation, you talked about uh, you know the challenges of the of the uh, industry's image. Uh, and how that impacts uh, the attraction of students and emerging professionals to the industry. Um, 
do you have, um, you know, uh, I'm sure this is discussed uh, around the industry on how to change this uh, culture and atmosphere. Um, what is your uh, opinion on how this might be able to uh, be accomplished? Hmm. Yeah, no, and uh, first of all, yes, it has been discussed and we discuss it uh, among the leaders of, uh, of the uh, geophysical industry and with, uh, with our counterparts, obviously, and the, uh, our clients, leaders in the oil company, because this is a joint, um, this is a joint uh, problem. Uh, if you don't want to work for the oil industry, you don't want to work for Aquin or nor PGS, so it's a similar problem, uh, problem really. Um, I think first of all we need to be uh, show the world that we're proud of what we're doing. Uh, what we are doing is bringing energy to a world that needs energy. Uh, there is no solution to stop producing oil and gas. Then the world would have a massive energy shortfall, which would lead to wars and uh, hungers and, uh, and massive deaths. So, so in a way, we do something which is very important to the world uh, uh, today. We bring energy to people. And uh, there is no chance of bringing uh, millions and millions of people in Africa and Asia out of poverty without increased amount of energy that is needed. Uh, so we, we do something very important uh, to the world. At the same time, uh, uh, today, producing energy to this world has this uh, has a byproduct, it has, uh, which in, uh, influences the climate. And we need to be able to take that um, seriously and discuss it seriously, as we just did on the, in the question recent here, uh, and take it uh, into ourselves. So, so we need to be able to be proud of what we're doing, uh, and at the same time acknowledge that there is a problem, and uh, work with others that are trying to solve this prob uh, pro uh, problem. Because currently, I feel there is a, uh, a little bit of an image issue in that. In fact, it seems uh, some se people seem to be blaming the oil and gas industry for the problem, while in fact we are actually producing the energy everyone is using. Uh, so, if you're going to blame anyone, it's the uses of energy in in the world. Uh, but I don't believe in blaming. But uh, but that is where the image problem comes from. So, so we have a bit of. Um, image building to be done, uh, all of us, uh, to show what we are doing and why we are a, an important uh, part of uh, bringing energy to the world, which is an important uh, social, um, social task in the world. And without our efforts, uh, we could not have done this and uh, the world would lack uh, dramatic, uh, dramatically lack uh, energy. So there is a little bit of an image building of what is really going on uh, and then a realization uh, that we also are part of the problem and, and, uh, and a discussion of how to solve it. And uh, for younger people this needs to come in and it also needs to see that we are taking it seriously so that you can work in this industry to be proud of what it's doing, knowing that also this industry is uh, trying to solve the issues uh, of uh, of climate change, of uh, pollutions in the oceans, uh, of other very large scale global problems. Um, and as, as uh, some of you know, in PGS, we, um, we are trying to launch and we put money in seeing how we possibly can uh, help the world clean the oceans. It's not an easy task and we may not be successful, but, uh, but we are at least uh, making a serious effort in whether we can assist in that, uh, so that everyone is doing their part in, in these things. But we need to get this out to people because we do have an image problem currently. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have one more question, Sariana. Uh, Runa, you mentioned, you talked a little bit about R&D investment and uh, the fact that in recent years he has been focusing mostly on short-term uh, research and that there's a need for the future, especially because we need to, to do more successful exploration, there is very likely a need for more technology development. Uh, now, I see the, the conundrum because of the recent years, the economy, etc. But what do you think about standards and cooperation among the contractor, the contractor industry? Uh, yes. For example, do we need three multi-component cables in the industry? Those uh, types <laughs> of cables take several, several years and a lot of money to develop. And mm. in 
just in this downturn, we have three different versions. Would it make sense for, for projects like that uh, to, to be developed in cooperation between different uh, companies? What, what is PGS's view on this? Hmm. Yeah, um, in general, yes, it makes sense for, um, for technology to be developed uh, together. Uh, at least when we're not talking about call it differentiating technology uh, in which we compete. Uh, and uh, and I think uh, this is a realization that is going uh, on in the industry currently, and uh, and uh, there is no secret that we are discussing several initiatives among the bigger companies on so whether we uh, could cooperate uh, to bring down costs and bring solutions uh, to the industry, which would um, which would. Uh, you know, either make it a bigger market, or uh, or make sure that we have access to all the markets we uh, we are in today, things like that. So yes, um, more cooperation is necessary. We are not a big industry, and we have large uh, challenges. Um, with respect to your uh, streamer question, it's more, uh, I guess, it's more difficult because obviously, uh, without streamers, none of us can operate. So it's an absolute necessity to be able to, to, to just be an acquisition company. And, uh, and if we said, okay, one of us will make that. So we make one of us the monopolist of uh, something that everyone needs. Um, that seems uh, not a solution to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to solve it. It would probably be, maybe be cheaper, uh, but I believe in the end, the monopolist will probably take out, uh, take out the, the advantage of that so when it comes to things like that uh, there is healthy with some sort of industry because it drives people against each other new ideas uh, and uh, and uh, make sure that uh, if you have alternatives prices stay down things like that so so the answer is more complex than just cooperating at least when it comes to very 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 key equipment like the streamers but yeah, there are many many, other things, many many other things that we can cooperate on yeah, no, I agree. I mean, there you need to have some differentiation. But where yeah. do you see uh, the possibility of standards or having something that is more more standard that can save money? Yeah. Have you? Um, one example is uh, which we have discussed uh, at length at several of these uh, conferences is uh, we are uh, in the, on the source side. Uh, for example, a marine vibrator, where which is a more friendly source, uh, environmentally friendly source, uh, could be one area where you just do it together and everyone gets access to that same source, and then we would have less issues getting permits. Uh, we would have less issues with uh, fisheries and uh, marine mammals, uh, things like that. That should be an area where we don't have to compete but rather where, uh, where uh, we would open up the market more for everyone and therefore it lends itself more to, for example, cooperation. That's one example uh, of equipment which we could uh, develop together. Yeah, thank you. And mm -hmm. one last uh, question. Uh, it's, there's a lot of talk about machine learning and AI. Is this something where PGS is working as well? Um, Everyone who has a large amount of data, <laughs> including owners of seismic data, uh, are looking into this uh, and uh, and seeing what kind of possibility uh, sits within this area. Um, so yes, we are of course doing the same. Uh, there are potentials in cost savings, and there are potentials in improving uh, improving images, and there are potentials in uh, correlating. In, uh, seismic images with maybe well uh, well logs etc uh, when you have big data and machine learning in there and there are multiple other opportunities uh, which may or may not be doable uh, I think the trick here is to uh, is to identify your or your business goals and uh, and take it step by step because uh, we probably can't do everything at once but there is in my opinion uh, great opportunities in uh, in uh, this or uh, they call it digitization uh, evolution which we are currently seeing and uh, and you see companies like uh, Google and uh, and uh, Microsoft Amazon 
coming into uh, our industry. Um, I don't think it's going to be long before we see them uh, taking part in uh, in um, our conferences and things like that. So they become more of an integrated partner uh, in what we are doing. And the reason for that is yes, there is great opportunity for um, for this um, or great business opportunities in many directions uh, in this uh, in this area. And we are of course looking into it uh, in PJs as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a, a question that came in uh, via the chat. Um, uh, one of the problems with the Toad streamer market has been a chronic oversupply and capacity. At the moment, we seem to be finely balanced, but going forward, when demand hopefully recovers, what's to stop new players or uh, stack capacity coming out and uh, then the oversupply will persist? Uh, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, no, um, that is, uh, that is uh, part of the nature of our industry and many other industries. Uh, unfortunately, it's either oversupplied or undersupplied. That means the prices are either, uh, either too great or too low <laughs> to survive, uh, either for the client or for us. Uh, and uh, uh, I still believe that volatility will persist uh, going forward. What is new this time, obviously, is that we have all these stack vessels uh, sitting sitting uh, in a way ready to um, ready to be entered into the market uh, which may uh, do two things uh, it may of course lead to uh, vessels coming into the market quicker than if they had to be built uh, but you have to remember that none of them have streamers so you know you need to build a streamer and uh, invest 50 million dollars in even the stack vessels to bring them back in it takes a year 50 million dollars to bring it in uh, but that obviously is cheaper than building a vessel, so that could lead to more vessels coming out quicker. Uh, it could also lead to uh, people saying, okay, well, I'm never going to build a vessel while there are still vessels stacked because someone else could just bring it in cheaper. Uh, so they will keep a lid on new builds, which would then again be positive. Uh, and as the lead time of bringing it in a stacked vessel into the market is shorter than a new build, uh, one would at least hope that we would be able to adapt quicker to the market. So if we get an oversupply situation, it's easier to put it back in. If you have 10 new builds on its way, halfway built, you can't stop them. They come into the market whether the market has crashed in the meantime or not. So there are some dynamics sitting there, some which may give you optimism that this may uh, change or the cyclicality will dampen a little bit and others uh, uh, which may not give you that kind of an optimism. So we'll see how this plays out this time around. But um, I don't think we can get away from uh, a bit of cyclicality and a bit of oversupply, undersupply dynamics even going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one last question, possibly. Uh, well, I, th I think we've, we've answered all the questions. Uh, I... I Really enjoyed the discussions. It was great, um, and uh, I guess uh, we are just about done. So thank you very much, uh, Rooney, and uh, thanks uh, to everyone who has attended and asked questions. Um, and uh, this is part of our uh, SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee webinar series, State of the Energy Industry in Europe. Uh, those of you who attended, uh, you will receive a follow-up email. Uh, please let us know what you liked, uh, what we could do better, uh, suggestions of future webinar uh, series topics. Um, and so please look forward to our social media posts to register for next month's uh, interesting talk on the recently revised SE, uh, Segway to Seismic Standards. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rooney, uh, for... Uh, presenting a very wonderful uh, presentation and great question answer discussion. So uh, until next month, uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you. All right, goodbye. Bye-bye.